future trends, deep insights, industry leaders. This is the iGaming Next podcast with your host, Pierre Lindt. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome back to the uh, Game Next podcast, uh, Paul. It's good to have you back here. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you. Very, very good. Uh, we were just saying in, the, in an earlier recording yesterday that uh, we, we are fortunate to be in an industry that uh, never sleeps, so to say. There's always something new and exciting happening. And um, today, of course, uh, we are doing this kind of emergency podcast uh, today to discuss uh, evolution and the latest uh, developments in this story where um, a short seller report came out uh, about a week ago uh, from an anonymous uh, competitor, according to the short seller, that basically accuses uh, evolution of uh, taking bets through with their partner operators from customers in, uh, in countries that are sanctioned by the US, like uh, Syria, Iran, and obviously this has caused uh, a lot of turbulence on the stock market. Evo has fallen something like 30% on the stock market so far wiping off like 10 billion dollars from the market cap uh, but uh, to get things started paul uh, i would love to have your summary of this uh, report the report itself is about 100 pages long of course uh, but can you give us uh, your uh, spin on on uh, what has happened and what's in this report sure so I, I think that the key issue which has concerned people and understandably it's the issue that um, evolution has responded to is the question of whether or not Evolution's products are available in highly restricted and highly sensitive countries, and also what the movement of cash means, and the report uses the word cash a lot. And cash is a slippery term because it can have several different legal meanings, and it has a colloquial meaning. And the colloquial meaning is usually the, the, the notes you find in your pocket. And obviously, if you've got... Um, money moving hands in places like Iran and Syria in that sense and money on the ground moving hands, then it's quite easy to sort of point to theoretical dots that say evolution is part of the movement of money around, you know, um, highly restricted and potentially terrorist controlled countries. And I think that's where the report is, I wouldn't say clever, but potentially very deliberately suggestive of, of, of such behavior, which um, is obviously spooky. And I think it also draws upon a couple of very distinct but superficially similar legal frameworks. The first is that in the US and some other jurisdictions, um, the, 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 the regulatory regimes are designed to keep crime out from an historical issue of having crime in. So the mob in Nevada, East End gangsters in the casinos of London in the, in the late 50s and, and, and early mid 60s, the mafia in Italy, all of those things have shaped gambling laws and continue in, in Italy's case and Malta's case to shape issues um, to this day. And, and, and one of the three key principles of the UK Gambling Act is to keep crime out. But the key issue there is that it means that you mustn't have organized crime owning a gambling company, which unless they're buying shares through pension funds or hedge funds is not the case in Evolution's case, or infiltrating the supply chain, which park Evolution for a moment, but that then becomes a more interesting question, which we can talk about if you have resellers or customers where you don't do sufficient KYC. I would hope and believe that Evolution's KYC um, processes are sufficient. And I think that's another sub, sub point before we come on to another point that we bandy about, and I think it was Betfair that started using this term, and we raised alarm bells at the time, unregulated. Unregulated means you don't have a regulator. It's a crystal clear term. 
It's a wrong term. And it's a term that hands a huge amount of ammunition to people who don't understand the industry who want to criticize it. Because in between regulated, domestically regulated, and unregulated, which is nearly everywhere criminal, you have regulated at the point of supply. Now, that then throws up a whole bunch of issues. So in some markets, it's fully understood that you can access a company at will, sorry, like a, a market at will because there are no laws to stop you. Um, in some markets, there are laws, but they're contested. In other markets, there is a, a lack of enforcement of laws that may be clear. And that's where you start getting into to, to the dark gray area where you then got to ask about what are the operational implications of moving money around here and what kind of clients are you keeping? And, and that, I think, is a more nuanced question for the industry that I think the report doesn't, doesn't really go into to the detail or the nuance that it would need to to land real blows that can't be explained. So that, that's the first issue, that you've got the, the what is the, the, the question around keeping crime out and what is the question of unregulated, which I think are muddied about. And the reason why they can be muddied about is the second more modern corpus of law about anti-terrorism, um, anti-money laundering law, which again, for um, markets and, and countries where there are very, very high risk um, of that, like Syria, um, like Iran to an extent, um, you've got a really big issue. But again, then, there is a question of where do you draw the line? Um, and what, what, is the, what is the issue at stake? It's fairly obviously um, a KYC problem if you're taking high roller um, money from, from, these, from these markets, or, or indeed any money from these markets, but Evolution's made it quite clear that they have um, checks to ensure that the IP address is clean and that the, 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 the addresses are clean and that they, they've been got around through VPNs, etc. And also what's incredibly important is that Evolution is a B2B provider, so it's not actually directly involved in, um, in customer activity. That said, it is important for them to understand just how grubby their licensees are. And so the question then is a question of degree. And since Syria has been mentioned, I, I, I put it like this in a sort of ISIS context. Uh, the fact that lots of ISIS terrorists had smartphones is not going to be something that is blamed upon Apple or Samsung or Huawei. The fact that they'd all downloaded WhatsApp uh, and communicated with it is not necessarily an issue there but the content that they used and the frequency with which they used it becomes an issue. And so therefore the issue is if this is a few people circumventing some fairly robust rules, then it's not so much of a problem. If it is a constant and regular use, then clearly the terms and conditions are not good enough and need to be tightened. And the extent to which they're not good enough opens up the question of legal risk. Again, Park evolution in general. The, 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 the then the question is take the, 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 the number of Toyota pickups that ISIS was using at their peak. Um, if all of those Toyota pickups had been bought by various second hand car dealers throughout the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent and Turkey, then you know what can be done? They, 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 they love a land cruiser, they're really reliable, they're good in the desert, why wouldn't you have one? But if it were found that there were specific resellers with a direct relationship to Toyota, who were suddenly had very big orders and were executing on these orders that were facilitating the offensive power and the logistics of ISIS, then big questions have got to be asked. So again, it's not the question that these trucks are in theater, it's a question of how they got there and to what extent where there are sufficient checks. Could there be sufficient checks that they got there? So right. finding that there, it is possible to do something is very different to finding that there is intent or finding that there is criminal activity going on. And I think the report weaves all that together. And the great thing about using terror, particularly in a US context, is it 
scares the hell out of everybody. Okay. There is no <laughs> like way, as a regulator, if, if someone's accused of facilitating terror, they'd be like, <laughs> no, they're not. Don't be silly. <laughs> You've got to look into it. Yep. And the, the, the fact that you have these two totally separate but, but philosophically connected pieces of, 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 of legislative origin keep crime out of gambling, stop exactly. terrorists from moving money around, and you've got a powerfully toxic combination of things to throw at a, at a sector. And I think where the sector in general, and again, not talking about evolution at all specifically, where the sector in general is probably dangerously relaxed compared to where regulators and the uh, particularly lawmakers are going, is saying, if I follow precisely the letter of the law, and I ensure that I have got terms and conditions in my contract that says that my, my supply chain or my, or my client base follows precisely the letter of the law, I'm covered. Because I'm looking at you know, whether or not I'm going to end up in civil court and I can say, well, look, my contract says that you're not allowed to do this. And they went ahead and did it anyway, and that's really terrible. So what can we do? And I think we're probably moving away from that. And we're probably moving into an area where KYC has got to be more robust. But the issue with that is that KYC, from the context of, 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 of AML and gambling regulation, is usually set down by the law and, or, and, by, and by, by regulation. And companies have got to follow it. Mm. And it's very important that they do follow it. Trying to second guess it trying to say well you know maybe maybe we need to do something else or different or more safe might be appropriate in in areas of ethical concern like social responsibility in the in a safer gambling sense but in the context of money laundering and the context of terrorist finance there's a lot of law out there for a very good reason that needs to be followed strictly so the key issue is is the industry being too sloppy in the application of that law and are certain hubs uh, that provide point of supply regulation like Malta, like the Philippines, potentially too sloppy in that law. And frankly, you know, the, the issues that Malta has had with Italian mafia and, um, and the, the financial action task force and that sort of thing suggests that, that probably it needs tightening up. But this is a question that lawmakers and regulators need to address and impose. Yeah, right. right. Much, sorry, go on. Yeah, um, feel free to finish your point, and then I'll, I'll summarize a bit. Sure. So it's it's but it's it's more an issue of is the law and our regulations fit for purpose in this risk matrix that we find ourselves in is a really interesting question. Right. It's a separate question to can I access. Uh, live dealer provided by evolution through a third party provider through a reseller using a VPN in a country as an individual those are, that's a that doesn't get you even close to the underlying risk factors that ought to be addressed here right right so so to summarize essentially what we are saying here is that it's um if the, if the laws are robust enough on the uh, anti-terrorism front and AML front, um, there still might be edge cases where um, if you really want to circumnavigate uh, these uh, systems, you might be able to do so. But uh, as long as it doesn't, um, it, as long as it doesn't scale, essentially, uh, there, there will always be edge cases uh, and circumnavigate to any uh, any restriction. Uh, it's not going to be perfectly watertight. Uh, but I think uh, what is the question from the report as well is the short seller is claiming that evolution is very well aware of the activity that is coming from these markets. And I think that is uh, a little bit uh, what the ethos is of this report, that is, if um, evolution is closing an eye to the activity um, and, uh, and, and a, a substantial part of the revenue knowingly comes from these markets, then perhaps that is what the issue is. Well, yeah, and again, I think we don't know the answer to that question. And I think it would be inappropriate to, to make any comments that are directly related to that. Right. But I think that that is absolutely the broad issue. Um, and right. again, I go back to this, I think, really important distinction of 
bad money. There is the bad money of can somebody who is a gambler gamble in a place where they shouldn't be gambling, either because gambling is banned or because they are a criminal and therefore you are um, effectively receiving the proceeds of crime as an operator and then downstream as a supplier. And that's a serious question, but it requires a completely different set of questions to what the original purpose of US regulation and anti-terror regulation is, which is stop organized crime from laundering money and benefiting from online or, or, or land-based gambling. Right, right, right. If we, if I remove it to, to from a different perspective uh, here as well, I mean, there's the um, there's the legal question, of course, ha- has evolution done anything illegal by 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 allowing this uh, play to happen uh, on on their on their games? But uh, obviously, uh, it's a very difficult question to even begin to to answer, other than do speculation. Uh, but I think the other uh, part here is, um, to me at least, it is. Um, what responsibility does um, evolution have towards, like from an ESD perspective, uh, in order to uh, keep their business ethical? And um, so you could ask the question, for example, uh, what responsibility do Evo have to do due diligence on their uh, aggregators and operators from an ESD point of view, uh, if they are aware or if they could be aware that uh, there potentially is uh, uh, play that's coming from um, from nefarious uh, sources, let's say, or from nefarious operators. Uh, do they have any responsibility at all? Because they, according to the statement by Martin Qualison, he is uh, he's being quite clear and saying that we do not have contact with uh, the customers. Uh, we have relationships with operators, and we um, we expect the operators to follow uh, the, uh, the the restrictions that are on them uh, in these cases. But should evolution go further? Is that enough? I think. Let's, I think that I'd offer one, one sort of slightly more murky example where to, 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 to see whether complexity is in drawing the line and, and, then, and then move on to that question. So from an ESG standpoint, is it um, acceptable to say we are going to follow, we're going to, so we're, we're offering our product in a regulated market that contains so domestically regulated market that contains absolutely no requirements to, from a safer gambling standpoint or utterly de minimis. Um, but we're not going to allow a grey market operator that takes money from dot com markets, but that employs really stringent safer gambling um, requirements. I don't think it's for the supplier to choose. I don't think it's, a, it's appropriate for one supplier to choose, because if one supplier does choose, another supplier will, 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 will turn up and take its place. I think where there is an issue is where it becomes egregious. So if you have um, a licensee that only has a point of supply license, whose traffic, which you can look at, is very obviously dominated by questionable areas, and doesn't seem to have any sort of balance or legitimacy to its business, then in the days of dot-com, that was unequivocally nice cash to have. Not mentioning, not looking at evolution in that context, in general terms. That is the bread and butter of old-fashioned dot-com. It is undoubtedly the case that we are moving away from that model. So... I'm not sure that I'd want to go down a path of moral judgment or ethical concern. What I would say is that it is increasingly polarizing to decide whether or not you're in point of consumption and light gray or whether or not you're prepared to swim in dark gray. And the idea that you have a portfolio of risk is fine if it's only on that sort of very margin where there is not a great deal that you can do about it. But if you're 
leaping into dark grey markets, not just where you've got some laws that say that we're not sure about gambling, but they're unenforceable because they were written in the 1950s and it doesn't look like there's any real sort of policy framework behind it, but where you're actually having to do, or you, your operators are almost certainly having to do dodgy things to move money about. Right. Um, that then becomes a much more complicated question that is probably going to get the sector into trouble because the issue here is that it's not just and this is why this report i think has been written the way it has and put out the way it has and this is where there is an ethical question it's not really so much an ethical question it's a political damage question <laughs> is there a danger that the laissez-faire approach that new jersey has taken which has put a few noses out of joint, where New, New Jersey basically realized that in order to get an online gambling business going, they were going to have to invite non-US businesses, because US businesses have been so constrained by regulation and various levels of operational incompetence, but also <laughs> regulation, to prevent them from, from, from being credible operators. Hmm. And, and, and in many respects, credible suppliers. That's going to leave a lot of bruised people who are now saying, hang about, these are businesses that have grown in a world that was denied to us, and now they're going to turn up to our own backyard and eat our lunch. Uh, you can understand why that's going to annoy some people. Yeah. And there comes a point at which there is a sustainability issue, and it's not just a question of, ethics and it's not just a question of law it's a question of politics when does it suit a critical mass of u.s stakeholders to say we're not really comfortable anymore about this sort of sense of you can do business anywhere in the world without without any issues we really want to police our supply chain to make sure that it is you know beyond reproach oh and look that happens to suit our own american operators and suppliers because they've now got critical mass and, and capability. We've been saying for some time that that day is likely to come. And, and yeah. when it does come, it, it's really, really painful and dislocating. And I think that this report is, is part of the mudslinging to make that happen. Exactly. So, so it's, it's a great point you're bringing up here, because uh, I think it's important to point out that from industry perspective, uh, this is not really a, a surprise, this report, but uh, what's within it, I would say. And, and obviously, we come from uh, from a, a background of dot-com brands, which are operating in all the jurisdictions uh, possible, let's say. But um, we are reaching a critical mass, as you point out here, where evolution is now, um, well, was a $30 billion dollar uh, market cap company uh, with uh, active investors uh, in the US, institutional investors, uh, ESG again is uh, is on the rise and um, the critical mass come to the point where the industry is now evolving into something different where the investors particularly are putting pressure on uh, the organizations uh, to, to uh, well uh, actually really to understand the industry better let's say and uh, so even if this has not come to light previously uh, it has now come to a point where the industry is morphing into a more mature future, potentially. And could it be the case that uh, the industry has to take a step back in order to take two steps forward? Do you see that this could have any wider consequences? I think this is um, following a pattern which is change shape due to the nature of, 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 of the scale of, of, of online adoption, but actually right. has been prevalent for many decades of gambling legislation. Very broadly speaking, gambling businesses are safe if they do one of three things. One, they're highly taxed. That's why lotteries, people are relaxed. <laughs> you know, paying 70% tax, what's not to like? <laughs> Two, they're an intangible export. So you're effectively turning the gambling habits of, of, of the world into your own narrow interest in jobs and taxes. So in Nevada, that's very low tax, but very high jobs. For London High Roller Casinos, it's very low jobs, but very high tax. For Malta, 
it's very high jobs because it's point of supply. The problem with that is that you've got to sip a little bit from lots and lots of different markets and not let them get pissed off. Otherwise, you end up with the turf wars that we've now got in US commercial casinos. And if you look at a map of US commercial casinos, even though the, the casinos are in state, they're all on the border because they're all designed to take other states' money. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a race to the bottom of intangible exports. Right, 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 right. Or the third point, <laughs> you stay below the radar screen. Which seems to have done very well. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was why when online gambling was only a $10, $20 billion dollar market, and that sounds like a lot of money, but when it's spread across the world, that's not a lot of money. Everything was okay. That's why in the UK, when betting shops were in tertiary locations with no advertisements, they weren't considered particularly an issue. But when commercial gambling gets big, gets visible, but is not necessarily obviously benefiting the society that it sits within. I mean, look at Georgia has just decided, as in Georgia, former USSR, not state of Georgia, that it's, yeah. it's looking potentially at, at, at restricting online gambling. As soon as you move into the space of being a socially visible, you've got to build social sustainability. You've got to build that social narrative that says you're far better regulating us and having us here offering a product safely than trying to squash us and causing so many more problems of disordered gambling and crime. That is a completely different narrative than those first three. Because those first three, broadly speaking, let it away, get away with anything operationally. Right. Because you've got a built-in safety valve of, here's a whole bunch of tax so politicians don't even look. Or here's a whole bunch of jobs so politicians are absolutely in your favor. Or you can't even see us so politicians don't notice. That, those things have not yet been fully built into a broader environment of, 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 of where online gambling is. And they certainly haven't in New Jersey because it's low jobs and low tax. So how that then moves forward becomes a really interesting problem. And what you get is vested interests who nearly everyone's on the wrong side of that. Mm -hmm. And the biggest issue is that, that what it tends to drive is knee-jerk regulation. Right. So right, right, right. I think that that's the big broad narrative. And this is a little minor turf war within that big broad narrative. Right, right. It's 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 interesting. Like like you're saying, it's reached a critical mass and the point of no return uh, in a sense uh, where this is now top of mind, especially in on the European side of the agendas of the politicians and and so on. And and US, of course, uh, I would say. I mean, uh, it's uh, the the US is uh, seems to be much more. Um, it's a capitalist uh, country, of course, with much larger stance, siding uh, uh, more towards the side of the organizations, much larger uh, money flowing in from the lobby, from the lobby side and more power and so on. So it seems that the US uh, generally uh, are more on the side of the uh, organizations, corporations, rather than a stringent regulation. So uh, perhaps it would be that we'll on the US see. side, it will take longer time. Or what do you think? We'll see. Yeah. I think... Um, there are a few catalysts. So the, one of the biggest catalysts is advertising. Mm. And it's worth bearing in mind that the level of gambling spend per capita in the US is one of the highest in the world. But online gambling penetration is really low. Very low. Which means the proportion of revenue devoted to advertising overall is still tiny. Even though the advertising budgets of online gambling companies are absolutely eye-watering, they're only eye-watering in the context of their revenue, not in the, the grand scheme of things. Yeah. But that's starting to change. Right. They're becoming right. relevant in the grand scheme of things, but that's only just started. Yeah. So. But, um, let's see. Yeah, it's interesting. Happens. Yeah, it's interesting to see. I mean, uh, the likes of DraftKings uh, and so on has uh, has built itself into a household name in the in the states still, and, yeah. and they are not uh, they don't have this um, 
the same stigma attached to it as a brand as, uh, uh, let's say, um, Betsson or uh, Ninja Casino in Sweden, for example. The, the marketing is very different, right? And yeah. it's, 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 it's much more about building your brand and, and being associated in the right uh, and the Americans tend to be uh, a lot better at this, I, I think, in general. I think that's where we, uh, where we see a difference. But yeah. I have, a, I have a, a, another question to you. From another perspective, too, uh, Paul, like from an evolution perspective, from a, from a Martin Carlson perspective at the moment, uh, how do you deal with this issue? I mean, evolution traditionally have not been the, the most public-facing company in the sense that not even in the quarterly report do they do webcast, they, they, they do audio cast, right? Still, and, and, <laughs> You know, Pandit Collison is, is uh, very op operational and he is not really the person who likes to be in the limelight, uh, who likes to do uh, announcements and who likes to kind of drive a, an agenda. And Evolution has kind of done, done their things in the, um, I, 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 without having to uh, release big press releases or having to deal with, uh, uh, with, uh, with a lot of public facing issues. So it's a kind of a, a, a new uncharted territory for, for Evolution. And, and they have to tread very carefully in how they communicate now, because if they, for example, would, would say that, you know, we, we are going to take a look at uh, our operators and we're going to implement new uh, stringent due diligence processes, all of a sudden you are justifying the entire uh, short seller report, right? And then that can lead to other consequences and so on. Uh, um, and so how do you deal with this if you are Marty Collinson? So I think the most important thing to do is, is well, two things. First of all, if, if it's not been done already, internally make sure that your systems and processes are absolutely as robust as they can be <laughs> and be as open and honest behind closed doors as possible. Well, no, well, well not as possible. As, as required to your regulators and hope and believe that the whole thing blows over. I think the minute you engage in a public discourse on this, you're doomed. Because at the same time, though, Paul, at the same time, the share price has fallen 30%. You have thousands of investors waiting for us. Welcome to PLC land. Right, right, right. And you have like front pages in, in Sweden, the biggest uh, yeah. financial newspaper, all of yeah. it is evolution right now. Who was the winners? Who, who sold before? And I mean, this, this, is, this is at the freaking news, I mean, from, yeah. on the cover of the news stories. I mean, how, for how long can you be silent if you lose 30% of your market cap and you have investors asking you questions? Well, to be fair, they haven't been silent. They put out a statement. They put out a statement that makes it very clear that the, the, the core... Um, right. Accusations of the report aren't true. And I think the big, big issue here is actually not what was being accused at all, but valuation. The thing that traditionally, and you know, we might be re entering a traditional world of inflation and interest rates, God forbid. And I think this has got an awful lot to do with a lot of the corrections. Yeah. What used to traditionally be a flaw to share prices was a dividend. Well, try paying a dividend that touches the size, sorry, actually, that, that gets you anywhere close to being relevant to shareholders at the historical valuation ratings of evolution. <laughs> so immediately you have an eye-wateringly astronomical valuation, you are vulnerable. If any shareholder buys into a company at an eye-wateringly astronomical valuation and thinks they bought something that's safe as houses used to be, well, carry out emptor. Welcome to stocks and shares. They go down as well <laughs> as up. Tough. <laughs> so, so you're saying that... Um... Uh, even with the pressure that uh, Evo will have from media, from uh, from investors, that the best course of action here is to put the put the lid on essentially and ride it out in the best possible way. Deal with the um, with the regulators behind closed doors. P potentially deal with the uh, with the major investors on a on a one to one basis, uh, but uh, release the statement and uh, not say anything more because uh, what can they say more than they have already, um, un unless they want to. Uh, you know, implement some like broader 
um, <laughs> broader um, uh, ESG type um, restrictions now that they are that they are now going to exclude uh, you know aggregators or question of which is just um, it doesn't seem re a reasonable step to take, and that kind of Precisely. obviously leads down a slippery slope, which. Uh, which then they have to define what is a gray market and what is not, and uh, and so you know, sixty percent of the revenue comes from uh, you know you know gray markets, uh, mm. and so um, you know reasonably, it's not much that they can do from a PR perspective, and and uh, do stick to their guns and say we are we are B two B supplier, we supply operators that we uh, that that have restrictions on them, and it's yeah. uh, any further question should be answered to the operators and not to us essentially. Yeah, there's only mm. one reason why you need to run a share price rather than run a business. And that is if you want to use your paper for lots of M&A. Okay. And so that, that is where things become more complicated. But over time, albeit the last 10 years has been a little bit different, over time, it's on the whole been better to run a business than run a share price. But I think that the evolution share price has become, had become extremely fragile because of its extreme right, valuation yeah yeah right so so it also begs the question a bit um i mean we've see, we see how vulnerable uh, evolution is now to a to a, um, to a short seller report which doesn't really um surprise the industry itself uh, with any information that is not really uh, that damning and so on but um does this open the door for further short seller reports i mean uh, you, you would think that uh, evo could potentially be a target for short sellers it's it's cumulative effect um I won't go into the military analogies that we usually pepper through our reports, but essentially, the first couple of times you're able to do this, you generate shock. Shock yeah. generates overreaction. Overreaction right. is precisely what short sellers want. And even if it's not a question of short selling, if it's actually even a question of forcing an issue in front of a regulator for other reasons than the share price, you still need shock. Mm. Now, nobody died. So the next time this happens, people are going to be a bit less shocked. And the tangible damage is, like I say, no, they haven't lost clients yet. Mm. If there was suddenly an announcement that says, or, or you know, down the line that says, on, on the back of these revelations, we, we highly respectable operator are moving away from evolution, because we're not sure about just how robust their systems and controls are, then you've got an issue. Then it's a problem, yeah. But right now, that's not where we are. Certainly, that's yeah. not where it looks like we are. No. And so, if these short seller revelations, a little bit like with DraftKings and SB Tech, don't actually land any tangible blows, then they lessen in their impact each time they're deployed. But I think what is important to, 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 to factor in there is, is this issue of, of smoke and mirrors versus complete outright, you know, not fabrications, but stitching together circumstantial evidence and, 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 and small issues of, of being able to circumvent other, you know, generally robust systems and controls. Um, is 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 the key question? Is this HSBC and Iran, mm. or is or or is this um, a, 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 a very small issue that has been blown into something much bigger? We don't know the answer to that. There's no point yep. in speculating what the answer to that is. But if it is the case that evolution systems and controls are super robust, and that that that, that, that this is an issue of, of mild circumvention, then it, it will the, the the story will die of its own accord. Yeah. Right. Uh, a final question for you here uh, as well, Paul. From the regulator's point of view, um, do you have any examples of um, how regulators are viewing their licensee, the licensee's activity outside of their jurisdiction? Like, for example, uh, does the Swedish uh, regulator uh, even care about what evolution does uh, outside of the Swedish jurisdiction? Do they have any remit to even uh, ask that question? And the uh, same goes for, you know, in general, like, do, do, you, do you have any insight into potential so backlash from various regulators? This is where we have the issue of 
politics, law, and regulation. Mm. So regulators have a specific body of regulation that they must follow, but also in general terms, it's a pretty good idea that if the, if the licensees that they're regulating are following the law. So you don't need specific regulations in the context of, um, of, of, of online gambling to deal with money laundering very often because there's a whole load of money laundering law already that deals with that. The danger then is that if the regulator thinks that they don't have an issue there and then um, serious organized crime is found and the regulator is thinking, oh gosh, we didn't look because we've been following our own regulatory remit, you've got a pretty horrible problem. And that's where you've got that, that real issue with regulators with um, what is mission creep? Because everybody says, oh, you know, the regulators should keep their nose out versus what is ensuring you've got an absolutely, you know, sustainable licensee base. And I think the, the key point with, with evolution is very few regulators in Europe regulate B2B. Exactly. So is that a good thing? Well, we, we would say no, frankly. On balance, it is a, a good idea if you identify what are the core B2B um, systems and, and services that you need to keep an eye on, and you find a way to make sure that you, um, that you can see them. Now, whether or not that is through direct licensing or whether or not that's through other means is, is a separate question. But it's absolutely vital that there is a remit. So right. the, the, there is a separate problem there because you, you, you quite rightly made two distinct points. Do they care? Do they have a remit? Well, you can, you can be absolutely sure they care because when the politicians and the senior civil servants say, gosh, this is a, a, a flagship Swedish company. You don't even regulate it. Have you got any idea what's going on? They inevitably squirm. <laughs> and it's all very well to say, we're following the laws that you gave us. You haven't given us a remit. What could we possibly do? And they're absolutely factually right to say that. But who's a politician going to blame? The regulator or, or themselves? <laughs> so... Yeah. This is, this is where issues like this demonstrate that a specific, a focus on one specific thing in a regulatory environment causes all sorts of problems. Because when a big issue, a big potential scandal flares up, you find you don't have the remit. That's why, for all its faults, Gambling Act 2005 is really good in its core principles in the UK because, number one, there is a remit for core B2B. It's, 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 it's covered. There is visibility. Uh, number two, you've got those absolutely crystal clear principles of keep it fair, keep it safe, and keep crime out. So you look at principle number three of keep crime out and you immediately you have a remit to look at this. Hmm. And that's, right. that's pretty helpful. Yeah, right, right. Interesting. I mean, I, I, as a final thing to close off here, so from, a, from a US perspective uh, specifically, um, what I hear, and correct me if I'm wrong here as well, is that uh, the, um, the regulator doesn't really, uh, doesn't really care about the activity from outside of the shores of the US, as long as there is not a uh, legal enforcement from a specific uh, um, jurisdiction. For example, Australia enforces yeah. uh, the operators to a closed shop, then the US regulator expects them to actually uh, go through with that. But if there is no such uh, request, then there is nothing that the, uh, then the, then the US regulator will not uh, question the activity in uh, gray markets. This is well, what, I, what I hear from let, operators. So that is broadly speaking true, but let's just follow that through. That is a piece of guidance provided by New Jersey, which is broadly right. seems to have been followed by all the other regulators. Now, hmm. if that guidance were to change or any one of the other 20 odd now state regulators decides that they want to adopt a different attitude, then you've got a pretty serious problem. 
So that's another issue that, that we probably didn't touch on it on enough, and it's a good thing to end on. State by state gambling legislation in the US is ripe for playing this kind of game. Because you only need to spook one regulator and it's like un unraveling a, 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 whole, a whole piece. So, okay. like, uh, that, like we've seen in Europe, wonderful. of course. Yeah, Sorry? like we've seen in Europe, of course, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the responsible gaming side, where the uh, one regulator is trying to outdo the other in, in terms of uh, responsible gambling uh, requirements, for example. Um, once the yeah, bar is set, yes. the next regulator is not going to go under it. That's the best yes. Way. Yes, but in, 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 in Europe, you, 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 it, it, is, it, is, it is different again because you're not dealing with, you're dealing with state by state in terms of member state in an EU context, but there's still yes. an awful lot of independence. Um, right. in, in the, the, the ability to politicize the, in the US and the ability to have loads of different audiences, Mm. Um, to go back to, to terrorism and to, 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 to quote the IRA, the, the short sellers in spooking the regulator only have to be lucky once. <laughs> yeah, it's true, exactly. And that's a reason for them to keep on doing it, and that's going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that's where we have to kind of look out for uh, later. But um, Paul, it's been uh, absolutely great to have you uh, on here. It's always fantastic insights and, and uh, kind of clearing up some of these, uh, these stories, uh, even though there is a lot of uh, ambiguity around what's going to happen next. And it's, you know, it's really, really, really difficult to see how this is all going to play out from a, from a shareholder point of view and, um, uh, and also how then or if uh, evolution will uh, will uh, communicate this any any further or if this will just kind of start dying out so to say but um i, I want to thank you again and um and uh, hope to see you back here the next time we have a crisis on our hands uh, it's always uh, always great to hear so uh, so yeah take care of yourself and we we'll see you next time thank you pleasure thank you bye